My talk today is on the relevance of comp complementary and alternative medicine to the NHS. The three questions I'd like to address is firstly, what is the state of complementary and alternative medicine within the NHS today? Secondly, how can traditional medicines like acupuncture, massage, reflexology, Ayurvedic medicine stand up in the light of the scientific medical paradigm? And thirdly, what future do we see for complementary medicine becoming integrative medicine with the, within the NHS. In 2010, the British Medical Association voted to take homeopathy out of the NHS after 66 years. But God bless him, Andrew Lansley said patients should choose. So what we know is that one in four adults during the course of their life will have access to complementary medicine in, in, in uh, Europe and in this country. But where is the NHS today? Where are we with um, the state of patients' health? What's very interesting is that the third highest cause of morbidity and mortality in Western Europe and America is prescription medicine. Why? Side effects, adverse drug reactions, interactions between drugs. But what we also know is that all, healing, all organisms are endowed with a self-healing ability. Natura naturans, nature heals. The House of Commons recently were entertained by the idea, or say perplexed, due to the over-prescription of antibiotics. Many diseases, bacteria, C. difficile, um, many others have become resistant to them. But what's also interesting is that the, the prescription of antibiotics in the last two years has gone up by 12%. Has the message got through? So, what is the challenge to the NHS? Well, one of the major ones is the growth of autoimmune diseases, multiple, multiple sclerosis, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, and unfortunately, conventional medicine has very few answers for those kinds of diseases which are on the increase. But I think what's more important where we are today is that traditional medicine, complementary medicine, con contains the concept of holism from olos, from Greek, which means a blend of mind, body, and spirit, Without addressing each of those as a unity, we're stumbling in the dark in terms of our patient's health. So, can complementary medicine stand up to evidence-based medicine? We've had lots of very enlightening speakers today talking about um, the scientific paradigm. I won't go into that because we all know what that is. Observation, analysis, hypothesis formation, and uh, that wonderful philosopher of science, Karl Popper, who said that every hypothesis must be fals falsifiable, which I think is a good start. But what's interesting, though, is that when Ayurveda was born 5,000 years ago, or traditional Chinese medicine, did they, were they able to con consult P Karl Popper? No. They had to address their own health issues. Nicholas Culpepper wrote the, Brit the, the, the British Herbal in 1640. He didn't know about the scientific paradigm, and yet I carry his book with me all the time. So we've, we are talking about, ladies and gentlemen, the medicine of experience. So, but actually the scientific tools we have are very useful. Random control trials, I'm a, I'm a, my favorite actually are pragmatic trials. It actually measure, measures medicine in the practice room. I've published papers on the subject. So we can actually use the scientific method to actually evaluate these traditional medicines. Acupuncture, homeopathy, Massage, we've heard a lot about mindfulness today. So what about, what does science tell us? Quantum mechanics, God blessed Einstein, E equals mc squared. Energy and matter, E equals mc squared, times the speed of light. Energy and matter are on a continuum of the energetic plane. As Einstein wrote himself, all we have, ladies and gentlemen, is the field and densities within the field. So, even classical mechanics, and God bless Newton, the second law of thermodynamics, for every action, there is an equal opposite reaction. Now, homeopathy is coming for a lot of criticism, I don't take it personally, for the infinitesimal dose. Now, that's in our favour, because if you give a minute dose to a patient, you'll have a minute response. For me, this is gentle, safe and effective. It also calls for the biphasal action of all medicine. So, Looking to the future,
can we envisage a time, as His Royal Highness Prince Charles envisages, where integrative medicine will be part of the NHS? We have four NHS hospitals offering homeopathy. London, Glasgow, Bristol, Tunbridge Wells. I went to a seminar with a, a homeopathic physician. She treats these autoimmune diseases very successfully, Dr. Geraghty at Bristol. We also know that there is a growing demand for complementary alternative medicine. People vote with their feet, fortunately. So who is leading the way in this, gentlemen and ladies? Well, we have the hospitals. We have the Hale Clinic. It's been going 40 years. I had a consultation 40 years ago with Dr. Petroni at the Marleyman Health Clinic. We have many examples of physicians. I know many who are trained in complementary medicine, acupuncture, homeopathy, you name it. And there are many homeopaths who work in GP clinics and who audit their results. So what's happening abroad? We are part of Europe. Let's talk about Switzerland. The Swiss did a study of a five-year period and they looked at the effectiveness of homeopathy. And what did they conclude? It works, ladies and gentlemen. It's now available for the Swiss NHS patients. Coming closer to home, the Dutch, very sound people. Well, they did a six-year study in Holland of complementary medicine. One and a half million patients. Not a bad sample, is it? OK, of those one and a half million patients treated over six years, what did we find? This was a, an e economic evaluation that 64% were having uh, anthroposophic medicine. For those who don't know, it's devised by Rudolf Steiner. has homeopathic aspects to it. Acupuncture, 15%, and homeopathy, 25%. It is actually the norm, ladies and gentlemen. Complementary therapy is so much more available in Europe. So the results of the, the six-year study is that health costs fell by 10%. Why? Less prescriptions of pharmaceuticals, less referrals to hospitals. So... It was also interesting that the, the patients didn't suffer from a lower or higher rate of mortality. So turning to something close to my heart, I'm a homeopath, I've been doing 21 years. We looked at 13 studies over a whole range of international databases, as you can see, Embase, Medline, etc. And we looked at three and a half patients over a period of, of five years, and eight out of 14 studies demonstrate that homeopathy not only helped the patients but reduced healthcare costs. And four studies found improvements in the health of patients as good as that of the control group. But what, what's more important than this than money, as we've found that money isn't the answer to everything, is that homeopathy values the relationship with the, with the, with the patient. It values being heard, it values joint decision making. This is what our patients need. It's not the therapy, it's the healer. Okay, so what does the General Medical Council say? Well, they say Harriet Gunn, that in 2050, we'll have integrative medicine. 200 years ago, we went to the herbalist. We, you know, we had the massage. But 20 years ago, people became very sceptical of, of uh, homeopathy in particular and many other forms of treatment. But actually, people are finding that it works. And she envisages, like so many, it will be part of the NHS in 2050. Let me conclude, ladies and gentlemen, by one story that really touched me, because I think anecdotes are important when you go into practice. I w I've worked in partnership with a paediatrician for 15 years and he sent me a, a nine-year-old girl who's suffering from Asperger's syndrome. Okay, he didn't want to prescribe for her, so she came to see me with her mother. And because I work as a craniosacral therapist as well, I said, so how did all this begin? Well, she said, I was um, on a fairground in, in one of these flying things, you know, whirly gigs, and the thing came off and I was thrown into a fence and fractured my left shoulder. And you know, I, I have this thing, I, I, I'm afraid something's going to hit me from behind, and I, I, I am worried. I said, no, that's quite natural, that's quite natural. But listen, will you do something for me? I want to teach you two things. But, and if it's okay with your mum, you lie on the couch, fully clothed, I just want to teach you two things. I want you to learn to breathe from here. It's called diaphragmatic breathing. How many of our GPs have the time to teach their patients diaphragmatic breathing? Okay, she got that, very smart youngster, and I want you to do something else. I want you to take yourself to an experience where you felt really safe, you felt really held, and I want you to visualise that you're there. And as she lay there breathing quietly, 
I said, how is that? She said, yeah, I've got this image. And I said, what's the image? The image is I'm swimming with dolphins in, in of Florida. And I said, wow, that's amazing. I said, as you, as you lie there thinking of the dolphins, think of that pain from your left shoulder dissipating, going away, and breathe in the energy of those dolphins you're swimming with, and settle with that. And I want you to practice every night, will you? Promise that's your homework for me. You know, within two, two months, the Asperger's label had disappeared. That young child had no more symptoms. So I think what I'm trying to say, ladies and gentlemen, is if we can restore the art of listening to the science of medicine, we will not, over, not only deliver better health care, but we'll also save that horrible commodity, money. But that's the truth. Thank you.